I'm Sandra Misch. I'm a rehab psychologist or neuropsychologist um, at Alberta Children's Hospital. Um, we had uh, some funding, um, 15 to 17 million dollars uh, from a family uh, donation through the foundation, and uh, they looked at two separate areas that they wanted to fund. One was complex pain, and the other was rehabilitation. And for the rehabilitation program of this by Riddell Children's Pain and Rehab Center, um, really was looking to advance quality of life for children, uh, youth, and young adults with disabilities. Um, so the primary goal of the rehabilitation program really is to support these youth um, and young adults to develop skills related to independent living, uh, medical self-management and advocacy, um, really to reach the potential um, in community life and lead meaningful, productive adult lives. Um, so the first initiative um, was to develop an independence camp. And really, uh, when Natalie gets into hers um, at Holland Blur View, I mean, they've had years and years of um, an independence camp and transition programs. Um, and so we have taken a bit of that. Um, it's a shorter format of a week, um, but it was an intensive week-long uh, transition skill building intervention for youth, and they were between the ages of 15 to 18. Um, and it's using a camp-like format, um, and this was piloted last summer. So camp programs are really being used, um, you know, increasingly being used with children um, with special needs and really recognize the service models uh, for children use as val um, valuable life opportunities, um, really for development and reinforcement of skills and growth and personal skills. So things like communication, self-reliance, self-esteem. And so the objectives of our independence camp really were to increase those functional independent skills, um, improve their community participation, leisure activities, and promote those health care transition skills um, for youth with mild to moderate motor impairments. So these were youth um, who came through the neurosciences program uh, and they either had neuromotor um, issues, um, so maybe they had a diagnosis of CP, uh, cerebral palsy, um, or they were youth that had um, a stroke um, and had motor issues secondary uh, to their stroke. Um, some of the skills that we addressed um, were community access and mobility, so we worked on transit skills, uh, different types of life skills like nutrition, cooking, grocery shopping, budgeting, uh, job and employment skills, so we went to a youth employment center and they worked on resume building, job applications, uh, recreation and leisure pursuits, so um, they had two youth, uh, young adults actually, uh, with um, motor impairments. Uh, who were involved in um, sports. So one played uh, sledge hockey, um, and another uh, youth, actually a young adult, sorry, uh, was playing wheelchair basketball. Um, and they also, we looked at self-management of their conditions, so we were using uh, My Health Passport. So there are a variety of community partners that were involved in education and skill building activities. And the activities took place on site at Alberta Children's Ho um, Hospital uh, throughout the city of Calgary and at a post-secondary campus. So some of the activities that we um, actually did, so we had, for example, when they were exposed to Calgary Transit, um, they came to us, brought a bus so that they could get on and um, safely get on the bus, kind of figure out how to use, uh, get on and off safely, um, and then also use the C train. Um, this, uh, in Calgary, we have a C train as well. Um, they used those skills. Uh, we had an amazing race day where they had to get around uh, Calgary and access um, certain information. So one was to get a SIM card, uh, to get the information for SIM card, um, obtain information for the young adult rehab clinic, um, get information about um, Albert ID card, um, et cetera. And so we incorporated all these activities where we had the community um, individuals come into uh, the hospital setting um, or 
they were also accessing them out in the community. And they stayed one night uh, at a post-secondary education um, and had to uh, budget for um, monies for breakfast, uh, for dinner, um, for grocery shopping, um, et cetera. Um, so it was quite an interesting uh, week for the youth. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about sort of what the program eval was. Um, unfortunately, I can't present on the data. We're still, I did a six months follow-up in January with the youth and the parents. So we're still putting together all that information. Um, but really, program eval, um, so it wasn't um, under ethics approval at this point because it's a pilot study. We just really wanted to understand what is the feasibility of this program? Is it sustainable? Um, what were the adaptations that needed to achieve optimal change, you know, what was the participants' response to the program, what did they learn, et cetera. So similar to um, Holland Blur View program, you know, we had, we measured participant outcomes uh, pre-post camp uh, using the um, Canadian Occupational Performance Measure and Goal Attainment Scaling. Um, we also looked at other measures to pro provide information about the youth over ad overall adaptive functioning. So like the Vineland, uh, participation in activities, so the child and adolescent scale of participation. Uh, we thought motivation and uh, self-perception were really important, and so we looked at dimensions of mastery and the self-perception profile for adolescents. Um, we also had focus groups after camp, um, and those were conducted with youth, parents and caregivers, the camp staff, and community participants to really assess you know, the perceived value and usefulness of the program. And so from that uh, focus group with the youth, so for example, um, some of the campers said, you know, their goals were to learn how to cook food better, how to make friends, um, how to get a job, uh, learn more about independent living and using the transit system, um, developing more confidence when talking with people, um, and um, what a lot of them said is that using, having the goal setting initially was really helpful for them during camp because um, it helped focus us <laughs> on what to teach them, um, but also helped them achieve those goals as well. And it made it very goal-oriented. Um, so what some of them said since that time, you know, that they're helping their parents prepare supper, so now they know how to use different tools in the kitchen. Um, now they're making dinner for themselves or making dinner for family and friends. Um, one of the goals, uh, again, was something about using transit system with confidence, and um, a few of the youth felt that that was actually going quite well, and they're using transit uh, regularly. Um, in terms of vocation, some you know went ahead to drop off resumes uh, to different uh, jobs, and some actually did get jobs after that as well. Um, and so I think they were quite happy about um, about the camp itself and the group setting of camp because they were able to work together. It was teamwork. Um, they got different views to achieve the goals. Um, there was equal treatment. Uh, they felt there was equal tra treatment no matter how different you were from the other campers. There were some independence of learning goals. Um, and uh, it was helpful to see uh, what goals other youth were working on and hear about what those goals were. I think what they were hoping maybe uh, for next year is maybe having some individual time, one-on-one um, -on -one time working on those goals um, and feeling that being able to talk more to people about those goals as well. And I think a few of them felt it could have been longer because <laughs> we had one week. Um, it was really four days with um, a little bit of time on the Friday, so it wasn't even a, a full five-day camp. Um, so I'm going to leave that right now. Does anyone have – maybe – I don't know if we want to go into Natalie's presentation then and come back around to ask questions. I'm okay with that, Sandra. Um, sounds amazing. Oh. So do I then just bring my... Sure. 
Did anybody have any questions for Sandra while Natalie's bringing up her slides? Well, I, it's Chantal at Chio. I would have a question for Sandra. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I sure can. Okay. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, did you have some youth that have some t had technology dependence, and and what? Um, how did you manage some of that? Yeah, so initially it was set up. Um, I know Natalie will give you a different view for her camp. So initially it was set up specific for youth with physical physical disabilities. Yeah. Um, so now all of the um, youth, of course, in terms of varying levels of cognitive abilities. However, right. one of the rule outs for the camp was low IQ. Okay. But they but they had to be able to direct their care. So there, there was, um, unfortunately, one of the um, youth that was supposed to come to camp, um, he had quadriplegia, but could self-direct his care. Um, but unfortunately, he didn't come to camp. So, um, but the varying levels, there were varying levels of motor impairments and definitely varying levels of cognitive impairments as well, but not low IQ. Um, and so, um, yeah, they had to be able to learn, they had to be able to direct their care um, or do their own care. Um, they had to be able to, there, had, there couldn't be significant behavioral or emotional issues that would limit their learning. Okay. Um, so there were definitely some inclusion and exclusion criteria for that. I mean, the hope would be, okay, that's, that's where I can go for this, is the hope would be this can expand to multiple populations, not just youth with physical disability. And because it is looking at learning <clears throat> everyday, you know, skills. Um, and this year we have two camps that we're offering where it's going to be, in a sense, we're looking at progression of skills across development. So this year, in a sense, we're offering a level two, which would be the same as last year, which really would be directed more at those maybe age 15 and 16, and then have an advanced um, camp. So some of the, most of the youth actually want to come back again. Um, so that they'd go through the more advanced level three camp, um, which would be 16 plus, and the likelihood is we might have some youth, even though they're outside of the child system, um, to come back to help with that transition. So they might be 18, 19, and still coming back to look at more advanced kind of employment skills, look at post-secondary education, maybe okay. more wellness talks and that type of thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you. You're welcome. Great. Um, thank you, Sandra. Um, I think just for purposes of this presentation, I um, hopefully everyone can see my PowerPoint. I just brought up a PowerPoint that I completed for 2014 last year because I thought uh, it would provide as an example just for all the key pieces that we want to um, speak about today in the next 10 minutes. Um, you might find that I might be echoing a little bit of the purpose and the goals that Sandra has spoken about already, as well as the structure and the program delivery. So um, that's a good thing because it's a system, I think, that works and a program model that works. So um, at Holland Bloorview, uh, a lot of, we have a long history of providing um, programs like the independence program that provide real, excuse me, real world learning um, and opportunities for children and youth, um, very much guided by experiential learning, um, principles and taking calculated risks and, you know, um, increasing independence, um, especially related to life skills, self-management, and in terms of um, supporting youth and their families. So the independence program is a three-week um, residential program offered at a downtown uh, Toronto University. So it provides a realistic environment uh, for the participants uh, to work on skills related to independent living. It's been running for over 20 years now, um, and it continues to generate um, and advance, you know, and collect evidence um, and, and outcomes for it. So it's a fully immersed, so residential 21 days, um, and they live uh, at Ryerson University, and there are three separate suites. So there are five youth to a suite so we can take maximum 15 youth. So it's definitely des designed um, by attending workshops to transition to adult services, um, you know, and increase their independence, whether that be uh, public transit, managing medication, um, uh, cooking, grocery shopping, budgeting, 
um, getting experience with you know planning for post-secondary uh, personal care as well as safety in the community um, social opportunities as well so a lot of uh, and hopefully they have fun along the way <coughs> excuse me so basically um, over the last couple of years this is an example of our group last year um, we have in the past provided the program for youth primarily with physical disabilities, but in the past couple of years, uh, we have opened it up for youth with developmental disabilities as well. Um, and as long as they are motivated to increase their independence as well as participate. So this is kind of a breakdown of uh, the group that we had last year. And they came from all over. They came from all over Ontario. So it's uh, staffed by a number of individuals uh, that it takes to um, you know, provide this program um, and definitely support the individuals who attend. Uh, definitely um, a, a lot of the professions are recreation therapists. We have occupational therapists, life skills facilitator, um, a social worker for the program, attendants, as well as nursing. Um, one name that's not on there is a youth facilitator. So it's uh, a former participant of the program um, who uh, also is there so that uh, they can address some of the anxiety or um, just kind of uh, provide an example and reassurance as well as direction and guidance for the youth who are there. So uh, that's definitely a key role that's important. So last year it was for three weeks, um, downtown Toronto, and just a, a brief example of you know how many applications, kind of a bit of a breakdown. Um, we do take 15 youth, um, and you know just depend. We have a metric for how we accept, um, as well as you know making sure that it's the right time and the right motivation. Just a picture of Ryerson University, which is where the youth live for three weeks. Uh, we are in the 6th, 7th, and 8th floor, but then we have a workshop room that's on the second floor that's all to ourselves. So we have a staff office and an attendant office, um, and then a workshop area. So an example of the workshop room, as well as the suite. So for many of the youth, as well as the families, uh, you know, it's not like home, so uh, they need to use the suite. Uh, an example of the kitchen, which is a common area, so they um, interact and make meals and plan, you know, who's doing what and the tasks with support, as well as uh, the bedrooms. So there is privacy in the bedrooms, but the suites can be um, co-ed. So um, definitely from an equipment perspective, too, we are able to provide hospital beds if needed or whatever equipment is needed for the youth who are attending. Um, we are outcome-based, so we do, uh, similar to what Sandra had mentioned, uh, we use the Canadian Occupational Performance Measure as well as the Goal Attainment Scaling. Um, we also have um, a survey uh, that we use to gather information um, and evaluate the program um, as well. So lots of opportunities to hear about some um, outcomes and feedback. Just to summarize last year, so these were the goal areas that uh, the youth had identified. Um, public transit is always, and meal preparation, always um, uh, a big one. Um, but just a breakdown, so social skills, money management, household management, and that, and that, can, that for last year was just kind of um, organization, um, advocacy, community safety, laundry, and personal care. So they each set uh, two. And then these were just our outcomes um, for our COPM. Um, and what our outcomes were uh, for the three-week program. So a, um, a change, uh, of, there was a positive change of 3.6 uh, for performance and then 4.3 for satisfaction. So the goal attainment scaling was um, also used. So most participants met or exceeded their goals by at least one point. Um, and so uh, that's pretty on par for, for a program of, of this design. So uh, we view that as a, a, a positive outcome. And also associated now, uh, we have our research and our, um, with the program. So this is just uh, to highlight some of the research that we are involved in, some of the journal articles that the program is involved in.
Um, and this year we are um, immersed even more so in um, in some of the research that's coming with um, you know just uh, more of the youth being involved. So um, one of the things that we do for the program that is fairly new is we have a welcome session. And uh, we have an opportunity to talk about research. And then at that moment, we also have an opportunity to plan and prepare as much as possible from an equipment perspective um, with the occupational therapist. Um, they have an opportunity to meet with the social worker um, just prior to the program just to see about support that might be needed. They meet with the nursing staff to talk about medication and medication management. They also talk with our research team to see if it's something that they'd like to be a part of. Um, it's not mandatory, it's voluntary, and um, it's something that uh, just, you know, to get our data. Um, they also get an opportunity to meet each other, and uh, I think that that really helps for the first day. So there's a, and the parents can meet each other and the youth can meet each other. We have a parent piece as well, and that can be um, as in-depth uh, for the parents or as hands-off. So it can be um, supportive phone calls or it can be chat rooms uh, or it can be over email. Last year we had lots of parents travel away from home. So we had uh, we didn't have a formal parent piece, but uh, we kind of leave it up to the parents each year. So um, something that uh, I don't know if the other groups have, it's, it's a welcome session, kind of an intake session prior to the program starting. We have a Facebook page as well that the youth facilitator facilitates. And uh, it's an opportunity for them to kind of get to know each other. And it tends to decrease the anxiety um, of, of that first day. Because then at least um, they'll have seen each other already. So that was our participants from last year. So it was a good group of 15. Um, many of them, you know, first time in Toronto and many of them um, going to college and university uh, in September. So, uh, this is just some feedback from some of the youth and what they enjoyed the most. Um, you know, and definitely uh, there there were some challenges just even in meeting new people and trying to figure out within the residence and disagreements and managing that and being able to transfer that to the home. <coughs> Excuse me. That was one of the pieces too. Um, so one of the things that we're working on now is the follow-up. So, you know, if you live in Kingston and you come to a program like this, you know, that's great that you learn to do laundry in a university residence, but how are you transferring that information home? And so we have a toolkit that we use that we try to cater and, and talk and discuss about how to transfer what they've done home and who are their support people. And on the last day, we talk about that as well. So now what? And um, definitely, uh, we're going to be putting something in place post-program um, to kind of support those goals and maintain that um, because it's a lot of time and it's a lot of energy and effort and, um, to come to this. And we just want to kind of continue on with uh, the goals and with the progress. It's really a program that we've had youth um, uh, be loyal to. So we have a reunion every year. And uh, we get a good number of youth. We typically get about 40 to 60 youth who come to the reunion. Uh, we have a Facebook page that there are lots of members of just to talk and maintain those networks. And we even have youth that come as mentors and help out at the program. Um, in fact, our social worker is a former participant of the program. So she's kind of come full circle where she was the participant and now she's the social worker. So. Um, this is just, I just, um, a youth had uh, included this, uh, and it was she was a writer, and I just thought to include it and add it because it was something that she read at the final day, and she had a hard time at the beginning. So it was definitely something that um, uh, she came full circle just in having it uh, uh, have an impact with her. And uh, she was living at home prior to the program, and now I've got an update, and she's out. She's moved out, and she has a service dog, and she's doing really well. I guess, are there any questions or? This is Chantal Gio. This is fantastic. Well, just two wonderful presentations. Thank you both for sharing. 
It's very inspiring. Yeah, I'd like to say the same. You know, there's all this quiet, and I think maybe we're all just in awe, but I certainly am. <coughs> Two fabulous presentations. It's so heartwarming. Thank you. Uh, it's Mary Peony, I just want to say thanks. And also sharing, we really need to share our learning from the scales you're using for the evidence of what's, what's being effective. And um, we could use a tutorial, I think, on some of these scales and how we could share them across our programs. It would be great. Yes. Thank you. And even after um, you know this meeting, I'm definitely open to any um, questions or or information that, uh, or clarification if anyone has. Thank you. So am I, um, Sandra Mish as well, and I was just going to add to the, two of the outcome measures. They're used quite extensively um, by uh, OTs. Um, yeah. So the COPM and the goal attainment scaling, uh, those are often used in rehab and by OTs. So um, there could be a lot of um, Within your systems, there might be, um, they could all already be used by your occupational therapist or other um, uh, physiotherapist, speech language pathologists. I know we use them quite extensively with our school program here. That's true. It's Sarah here. Oh, okay. Can you guys Mary? see my screen now? Mary, can you hear me? It's Elaine. Yes. Okay, sorry about that. I just wanted to ask, um, uh, just or actually it's not a question, but to Natalie and Sandra, just food for thought. Um, you know, it, it, the call is not out yet. Our call for abstracts or poster abstracts for this year's mm -hmm. conference in Quebec City. Um, will be out around the 14th of April, and if I can encourage you, you know, this is this this is the kind of uh, these are the kinds of programs and innovation and just just the inspiring comments that you've received today. I would really encourage you to come and share it with the with the CAFC community. There would be huge huge interest. And when did you say the deadline was? The, uh, the deadline actually is not until May 31st, but the call for abstracts, if you just keep an eye on the CAFC okay. website, uh, April 14th is when the call will be open. Okay. And uh, and then, you know, the, we, we close it around the 31st of May. Okay, great. So I, Thanks, Elaine. I think we'll add that to our um, agenda for our March meeting to start to drum up um, all the great transition work that's being done. Thank exactly. You. And, and you know, I'll, I'll just, um, it, it's not out there publicly yet, but the theme of this year is um, uh, child health solutions, and then we're actually doing it in both languages, so child health solutions and solutions uh, pour nos enfants. And um, this is this is a wonderful solution, <laughs> mm. you know. Today, this and, and that's all I could think of, um, you know, as you guys were presenting. So anyway, food for thought. Mm -hmm. so when is the conference? The conference is in Quebec City from October 18th oh. to the 20th. Okay. 18th to the 20th. Okay. Mm -hmm. That is food for thought. Thank Good you. Stuff. Good stuff. Okay, we're ready for our last presentation. Okay, great. So can you guys um, all see my screen? <clears throat> right now you're in charge. Um, so our program sounds a little bit different than the other we just heard about. Um, so you're in charge is a program that helps youth 13 to 15 um, living with all chronic conditions. And we try to build their self-management skills as they're cared for at the IWK, preparing them for transition down the road into adult care. Um, and the program, it connects youth um, with other youth with chronic illnesses. They focus on doing their own health summary, and that's something that's based on the Sick Kids Three Sentence Summary and My Health Passport. We look at exploring managing symptoms and uh, medications. 
And all of it is done, you know, with fun games relating to self-management skills. We do a big piece of the program that we look at is um, setting a goal, and we have action plans, and um, they're fun, um, very artistic -y kind of um, tool that we use to help the youth set their goals and look at barriers or um, um, supports that would help them attain these goals. So there's also a parent portion to the program. And parents look at uh, learning about youth development and strategies for supporting their youth to manage their chronic condition. And another benefit um, for the parents is connecting with other parents in the session. So a big piece of the You're in Charge program is actually the peer support that comes from it. Um, we include siblings in our program. And that is dependent, the program for siblings is dependent on the age, you know, of the current group attending, whether it's, you know, other teenagers or small tots or, so we can, we can gear their sessions appropriately. So it's a really youth and family focused program. We have two formats currently, and one is a weekend camp, so we're very fortunate in Nova Scotia. We have Camp Brigadoon, which is a state of the art, um, state of the art uh, camp in the Annapolis Valley, and so we use their facilities and their camp staff, um, and partner with them to bring the year in charge programming over a weekend format. And then we also have a half day workshop with similar year in charge programming um, provided for the youth parents and the, and the siblings. So the program development, we, in 2009, Nova Scotia Department of Health Primary Care Division was approached, approached the uh, Chronic Disease Management Research Group based at the School of Occupational Therapy at Dalhousie University. And the Executive Director of Primary Health at the IWK partnered with with Dalhousie to conduct an environmental scan and scoping review to relate, relate it to chronic disease management and services and supports for youth with chronic illnesses and disabilities across Nova Scotia. So we looked at, um, we did a lit review and did interviews with key informants such as IWK, health teams, um, youth with chronic illnesses, parents of youth with chronic illnesses, all the different health district authorities across the province, health charities, focus groups with youth, parents, and young adults. And what came back as the research recommendations were to develop and deliver a youth-focused, developmentally appropriate self-management program in a non-clinical setting. So followed up with a weekend retreat camp experience and with online support, allowing youth to stay connected and in the uh, social networks that they were establishing at the, at the camps, and to develop a program approach that would provide parents with the opportunity to connect with one, of, one another. And so at that point, um, additional funding was provided by the Department of Health for um, program development. So this is a look at what has been done over the course of the last few years, the last five years. And um, so we did the environmental scan and scoping. The next year there was a pilot um, here in the city. And, and the following year there was a pilot in the rural area. So during the fourth, fourth um, stage was when the family camp model came into um, being. So following that, um, we've continued over the last three years with the um, camp, weekend camp at Brigadoon. We've also developed a half-day workshop that we provide in the community. And we looked at adapting our You're in Charge materials 
to have a specific um, program for mental health populations. Um, and the mental health piece was, you know, to focus more on self-advocacy, disclosure, self-care, personal strengths, medication and management. Some of these are reflected in the current program. Um, personal health summaries, managing symptoms, and wellness planning. So one of the challenges I think that we've been facing with your in charge is um, recruitment of uh, families and awareness of the program for both the families and healthcare professionals working in the field. And so in going forward, we're going to be looking at partnering with our, our um, healthcare teams and providing specific um, half-day workshops here at the IWK in our team lounge, which is a very youth-friendly area, um, and, and hopefully making the program a little more accessible for those that can attend a weekend camp. So when we talk about the programming that happens during the weekend, or the half-day workshops, um, the youth really focus on communicating with parents, communicating with their healthcare professionals, medication management, their personal health summaries, managing symptoms, goal setting. Um, and all of this is done through small group, large group games, and sharing experiences. What the parents look at is the teen's emotional and brain development, um, teen behavior and risk management, adolescent transition, encouraging independence, strategy and sharing. They look at de de developmental transitioning checklist and mental health, and then parenting self-care for them as well. Some of our outcomes for the youth um, or to prepare youth to initiate management of their chronic condition and looking at increasing their knowledge and their confidence related to self-management of daily life with a chronic condition. We're also looking at support, increasing their social support and their ability to set goals and monitor their own progress. For parents, we're looking for parents to be able to initiate those discussions and negotiate behaviors leading to more independent youth self-management of a chronic condition and increasing their confidence to supporting their child, increasing their own so social supports and ability to set goals. And a lot of times during the sessions when we're working with parents, we have to refocus them on they're not setting goals for their youth, they're setting goals for their behavior, their communication styles, and, and bringing it back to, you know, working with them on their own action plans. So the evaluations of the program are, have been very positive, and following the participation in your in charge, youth have really shifted to a greater stage of readiness to increase their knowledge of self-management pr principles. They also rate their self-management behavior more positively, and they report re reaching goals related to self-management, such as speaking to their doctor directly um, or ma managing their medication. And results indicate that parents increase their level of knowledge of self-management principles, and they report feeling more positive and hopeful about the future. So they're more confident in their ability to negotiate the transition with their own youth. I think one of the key successes of the You're in Charge program is the peer-to-peer -peer aspect of it, both for the youth and for parents. And youth and parents come away with um, being able to connect to their other youth in the program. Um, we have a uh, Facebook page as well where youth can stay connected and um, 
then we also do a four-week follow-up with the family themselves to see how they're sticking to their goals and how it's translating into real life. So that's a look at your in charge. Do you guys have any questions? Hi, Sarah. It's Nancy. I'm just going to add, because I think you did a really great job, but maybe mentioning a little bit more about the youth leaders, because I think that that's a difference in the programs as well. Uh, that's a really good point. So with You're in Charge, the, um, the, the youth sessions are led by youth leaders. Um, and they are our, our current youth leaders. We have probably about five that work within the program have been in the in the um, the program since its inception. So a really really key part of the program is having a youth lens, um, having diversity inclusion lens on the program, and so the youth leaders are modeling successful behavior for the other youth that are participating in the workshops. So they really form um, key um, connections with each other and, and they're talking the same language, they've lived the, the same experiences and, and that's, um, that's where youth want to learn from. Sarah, this is Deb Duell from the Adolescent Transition Program at the Children's Hospital. Um, I have a, a question about, um, like, it, is it related, um, is, is it disease-specific education, or, or no. is it across all clinics? It's across all clinics. Okay, um, and have you found that that's um, a really positive thing, because um, you start to recognize that, oh, I have diabetes, I have epilepsy, but it's not so different? It is a positive experience. So, um, you know, for the youth that are participating in the program, they're building the same kind of skills. They're they're learning to talk to the parents, negotiate, you know, different um, freedoms. They're learning to talk to their doctors and the, and their healthcare teams. And so, we see this, this the need for these self management skills across the board. Mm -hmm. um, so they're not going to our program to learn how they're how to manage their diabetes per se. They're, they're learning how to manage their life. Yeah, how to have a life and you know manage a chronic condition in the midst of it, absolutely. Exactly. Did, did, did you guys um, look at all at the Stanford Chronic Disease Self-Management Program? That I, I know that it, the adult program is really well known, but they also are, are um, piloting one with youth. Did you guys look at that at all? Do you use? Any of that curriculum, the you know the stuff from that, or um, I do believe so. Um, in my position, I've been here for the last mm, probably six to nine months now. So a lot of the research that happened was prior to my um, time, but um, I know that our partner at Dalhousie, and I can provide you know, her contact information and her, her um, she'd be more than happy to share what exactly, you know, the research came from. But I do believe they did look at Stanford. Um, and I, I would also be interested in, in learning more about kind of the recruitment piece because that's something we struggle with as well is, you know, um, recruiting from multiple clinics and, and just engaging enough youth to kind of run the program. We, we can get parents who are really keen to come, <laughs> but our youth are less motivated. So yeah, yeah, I'd be really keen to talk about that whole youth engagement and, and recruitment. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a huge challenge for us. Sarah, it's Natalie. Um, you touched upon this a little bit, but what are you finding that parents want from a support? Like, what are they liking the most? Are they liking, um, I guess, what what does that entail? What pe what parent piece? How does it look? Um, so, for the parents, it's I I think you know one of the learnings from the piece that's being presented to them is 
okay, this is normal teenage behavior, okay, this is what I need to be concerned about, you know, when my, my, when my teen's taking risky behavior and they have their chronic condition as well. Um, so I think, you know, that's one of the key learnings that parents are coming away with. But a lot of times it's um, that peer connection of having um, families in the same room, parents saying, okay, so you've experienced this too, this is normal, this is, how did you deal with it? And it's those shared experiences and connection, and a lot of times we're seeing parents coming away with, you know, each other's emails and sharing contact information, and, and so, you know, we provide um, the four-week support after the program, but it's also the connections that they form and stay in contact with to have those, um, to have the ongoing support. Yeah. Great, thank you. you, you Sarah, you mentioned that um, there's a strong youth facilitator portion to the youth program. Who leads the parent programs? Are they, are they parents who've been through the program or professionals or? Um, right now, we're very fortunate to have um, our parenting facilitator who has both professional and personal experience. So it's kind of a win-win, and I hope she never leaves us. Um, but um, going forward, I think it's key to that, that piece of the program that we have both um, aspects. Great, thanks. Are there any more questions for any of the speakers? So we're almost, those were fantastic presentations. Thank you so much. I'm writing notes frantically, as I'm sure other people are. Um, I just want to say again that these presentations are posted on Ken, um, so people can hear them again and then contact you, because definitely that's going to happen. <laughs> and um, I think you brought forward some great measures when we look at our, our clinical guidelines wanting to be um, youth focused and family centered and we really want to measure what we're doing um, and you've, you've had this experience using these different scales and I can see that is something that's very important to our when we want to start operationalizing our uh, clinical practice guidelines so again thank you so much for the presentations. Thank you. You're welcome. Was there any other Comments or Elaine, are you still on the line? Any other uh, office business? No, I'm absolutely on the line. I just want to echo. Um, there was such a nice synergy between the three uh, mm -hmm. presentations for starters, and um, I just um, I, I just thoroughly enjoyed it. I learned a great deal, and and I love the maybe just one comment on the last one. Um, you're in charge. I love the generalizability. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that's so important. I, I think that's something that is so important for us to look at when we're building a program and, and that, that ability to apply to multiple populations um, I think has such huge value. And uh, clearly that, that was emphasized in today's um, presentation. So just, just personally thank you to everyone. They, they were outstanding. Thank you. So we have our monthly call, and everybody will get circulation of minutes. And um, keep your eyes open for the next Delphi round. Looking forward to everybody's direction and, and future work. OK, thank you. Great. Thank you very much. OK, bye, everyone. Thank you, Mary. Bye. Bye. -bye.